She went from a financial analyst in accounting to financial analyst in the marketing side. She's real excited about that because she wanted to get out of accounting. Oh, she did watch it. Like, watch it. She finance me. The county's kind of out of regard. It's kind of stretching for her. You know? It's kind of strange. That, you know, she got hired there and they worked for job description. I look at her. Oh, I can probably see that. Jerry, can you hear me? Hi there, Jerry. Okay, we're ready to go. Hello, Columbus. Okay, everybody, please. Can you can you hear us, Jerry? Yes. Okay, we're ready. Go right ahead. Right ahead. We can hear you. Okay. Well, um, our guest speaker tonight is um, is Mike Curtin, and uh, for those of you who haven't been in this class before. I would have to get a speaker instead of my you know, reading their resume. I asked them to basically introduce themselves. Um, and so, Mike, um, why don't you talk about um, what's happened to you since you came out of the room? <laughs> okay. Uh, Dr. Green, uh, students in the Bruce Institute, and Jerry, it's great to be with you. Um, uh, it's, my name is Mike Curtin. I'm a lifelong Columbus resident. I'm 64 years old, going on 65. Um, I uh, have been a Columbus resident for all of my life, um, born into an Irish Catholic Democratic family. If you were born in 1951 like I was, the chances were about 90 to 95% given to be a Democrat. Uh, it started changing in the 80s, but uh, back in the day, uh, if you're Irish and Catholic, that was synonymous with being a Democrat. So I, that was a family I grew up in. Went through uh, 12 years of uh, Catholic schooling, uh, uh, elementary and high school, and then I went to Ohio State in the fall of 1969 um, and uh, majored in journalism, uh, the OSC School of Journalism. Those were tumultuous times on uh, our campuses in Ohio and across the country, as, as you know. Um, and so um, at, at the time, uh, Ohio State had a very vibrant daily newspaper called The Lantern. The Lantern still exists. Like all newspapers, it's not as vibrant as it once was or certainly was when I was there. But I got a great education uh, in journalism because the times were so vibrant. We weren't just covering normal uh, campus meetings, uh, you know, the meetings of the faculty and student senate and that sort of thing. We were, we were covering riots. We were covering uh, confrontations with police, we were covering uh, all sorts of uh, things, uh, minority activism, the creation of the Department of Minority Affairs. Uh, it was just a great time to be thrown into the uh, pool, uh, if you will, and to learn uh, journalism by doing it. Uh, so that's not to say that the academic um, uh, the academic life wasn't important because uh, the School of Journalism in Ohio State was very good at the time and they got a, a great education, both learning and, but also doing uh, real journalism in real time. Graduated from Ohio State in 1973. Uh, during that time, I served an internship uh, at the dispatch um, uh, and I uh, was fortunate enough upon graduation in December of 73 to be offered a job at the paper based on a successful internship. And I spent the next 38 years uh, at the dispatch. I really started as a, as a summer intern, you know, getting coffee and running errands and, uh, and doing all the event work. And uh, I ended my career there uh, as a number two guy, the uh, president and chief operating officer of the dispatch printing company, which uh, besides the daily newspaper uh, was a couple of television stations in Columbus and Indianapolis. Uh, cable TV operations, radio stations, uh, real estate portfolio, commercial real estate, and a lot of things. So I, I had a great run at the uh, dispatch, uh, learned a lot, but uh, of my 38 years there, the, uh, the critical mass, if you will, uh, was my, my coverage of local and state politics. For about 25 years of those 38, I was involved on a daily basis on covering uh, local and state government and managing the coverage of uh, local and state government by a team of uh, 
uh, public service, uh, public affairs reporters. So uh, I really cut my teeth covering Columbus City Hall back in the 70s, and then county government, and then state government. I uh, met Jerry in the late 70s, early 80s, uh, with his working for um, Democrats, so especially uh, Lieutenant Governor and then Governor uh, Dick Celeste. Uh, I got to cover the, uh, uh, the legislative affairs and the executive branch of state government through uh, the early to mid 80s. So I became the chief political writer for the paper in 86, uh, and then later on I became editor and, and then associate publisher and, and president and so on. But my real love is public affairs um, because it's important, uh, because it matters, because it affects uh, how we live and, and uh, affects the future of all our kids and grandkids. So I've, um, probably for the same reasons most of you are enrolled in this class, um, I've had a, um, at least for my adult life, uh, a lifelong keen interest in, um, in governance and how our governance evolves and uh, how through the political process, uh, we decide who are going to be those people who do governance. So um, with that, I look forward to taking the conversation in whatever areas are most fruitful for uh, uh, Dr. Green and, and, and Jerry in the class. Mike, uh, you know, you ended with you know, 38 years, but uh, there's something you did after that. So why don't you tell them uh, that you crossed the line into the dark world and, and, and uh, what you did and why you did it. Had the fortunes of print newspapers not been so dramatically on the wane, I would probably still be at this stretch. Um, but after I became the number two guy uh, at the paper in, uh, let's see, in 1999, um, uh, the fortunes of print newspapers, uh, as you all know, began a, a serious downturn. Uh, interestingly enough, the 1990s were the most profitable decade for print newspapers in the history of newspaper in our country. Uh, and then uh, the recession in 9-11 happened and the acquisition rate uh, or the absorption rate of people becoming um, used to uh, and being addicted to the internet, um, you know, changed print newspaper forever. Um, and uh, in 2001, two, three, four, uh, in, in, in all those years, in the early two, the mid 2000s, as a number two guy, as a, as a chief operating officer at the dispatch, my job was to balance the books to, to run the operation, uh, to make sure that um, expenditures did not exceed revenues, and that was becoming more and more impossible to do. Uh, we, we had the first uh, layoffs in the history of the newspaper. Um, we were uh, whittling the budget down year by year. The future was clear. It was it was crystal clear that the future of uh, information was going to be digital and not in print. And I had a choice to end my career being a pink slip guy, laying off on the friends I grew up with, my colleagues, um, uh, or doing something else. And as long as we were going to be downsizing and, and doing more downsizing, I didn't want to be the guy uh, in charge of that. Um, and so I negotiated an exit plan uh, in 2007. I, uh, I left the front office and became a full-time consultant to the company to do their civic affairs and public affairs and their external uh, affairs, if you will. Uh, I did that for four years from 2008 through 2011. In that interim, I thought I would migrate to a nonprofit world uh, to do some nonprofit work because I had made my nest day. I was comfortable. And uh, the nonprofit world offers so many great opportunities to uh, to do important service uh, to a fellow man. I thought I would uh, do that. I had some offers, none of which really turned me on. Uh, and then, lo and behold, in September of 2011, uh, as happens every 10 years, the state was reapportioned. 99 new House districts were drawn, 33 new Senate districts were drawn. The General Assembly, and I'm reading my dispatch uh, one morning in September of 2011, and I see a new district where I live with no incumbent. And I thought, well, this could be interesting. Uh, I've studied uh, the State House for a very long time from the outside, and here is a, uh, a district, um, including my house, where there is no incumbent. And um, maybe I'll make this my grad school. I made it go to grad school, and I thought this would be an interesting applied politics, if you will, uh, grad school. 
And uh, even though he had been a registered independent for 34 years by that time, because newspaper reporters, at least for covering politics, ought to be independent, um, I started asking around um, Democratic leaders um, in the state, uh, all my good issues in the Democratic leader in the House, the Franklin County Democratic Chairman, the Mayor, the County Commissioners who were Democrats. I asked them if they had a candidate in the 17th House District. Uh, if they did, I would have said thank you very much and gone on, but they did not. They were an opening, they were scrambling for candidates because then, like now, uh, we were facing a March primary with a December filing deadline. And uh, here we were in the late fall of 2011 with, with no candidate lined up to run for the 17th House District on the Democratic side. So I said, here I am if uh, you want me. And um, there's no competition. So I ran for the Ohio House in a district that encompasses most of the west side of Columbus. Uh, was elected in November of uh, 2012, re elected in uh, 2014. And so for going on four years now, I've been a state representative, uh, enjoying the policy debates, enjoying the, uh, the policy argumentation on the House, not enjoying some other stuff that goes with the hyper partisan nature of a legislative branch these days. Uh, we're working on structural things, Work, worked on uh, State Issue 1, getting that on the ballot, reapportionment reform, which fortunately passed big time. Working now on uh, congressional districting reform. I worked big time last fall on Issues 2 and 3. I was the uh, Democratic sponsor of Issue 2, which was uh, basically the anti-monopoly amendment, which was somewhat controversial, but I thought we needed to get it done. I just wanted to go through, down that path. I'm ha happy to talk about how business interests of various sorts are trying to put their models in state constitutions across this country, at least in states that allow the, uh, the constitutional initiative process. I thought it was important to try to put a cap on, uh, on self-interest uh, in our state constitution. And as I worked on behalf of defeating Issue 3, not because my issue is marijuana, it's not, but my issue is constitutionalism, and I was uh, offended deely by uh, 10 individuals and their co-investors trying to insert their business plan in our state constitution. So I was all over the state on State Issue 3 and happily saw it go down the flames with the support of William Nelson, by the way, who was on our side on that issue, uh, which was an interesting anecdote. Um, I'm not running for a third term. Uh, I'm planning on staying involved in uh, public affairs and, uh, and policy matters, but I found a guy I want to support who's a good up-and-comer. And I believe that when you're like me and you see good up and comers that you want to support, getting out of the way and let them do their thing. Uh, as I said, I'm going on 65. My wife and I have four grandkids. And I'd like to have a little more freedom so my schedule's not set for me nine months out of the year. And I can kind of dip in and dip out of issues and races as I want to and not have to be tied down uh, nine months out of the year in Columbus when well, two of my grandkids are in San Francisco with our son and daughter-in-law. And uh, so I want to enjoy the flexibility and the freedom to have a lot of the elbow room and, uh, and do what I want, but not uh, be tied down. So uh, it's been nice to have a lot of people tell me that they wish I was running for a third time, but better to get out while uh, people still want you than the other way around. And um, so uh, I'll be looking for new things to do come, uh, come January of uh, 2017. So before, before we get into a, you know, a more of a political discussion in terms of uh, 2020 in, in Ohio, um, I know in conversations we've had just on a personal note that you've always said that your number one priority is family and your number three priority is politics. So tell me what your number two priority is. I'm playing baseball and, uh, and fast pitch softball. Uh, baseball is my love. I grew up with it. Um, I think basketball is curious to you, maybe baseball second unless I haven't reversed. But uh, again, if you're born in 1951 and growing up in the Texas in the 60s, uh, baseball was the uh, by far the only one sport. Uh, it's the one I loved and, uh, and fell in love with. Um, played a lot of uh, fairly competitive softball after graduating college and uh, uh, in my 20s and 30s and almost until I was 30. And uh, I didn't want to end my... Uh, career in senior leagues, you know, throwing out all the joints and having to get a bunch of artificial parts in my body like a lot of these uh, guys are playing senior leagues do. So I thought at age 50, a nice way to stay connected with the game would be to uh, take the training and become a certified uh, umpire for the Ohio High School Athletic Association. And so spring, summer, and even into the fall, uh, 
all over Central Ohio. I'm umpiring high school baseball and high school fast pitch softball games. And um, yeah, that's family is number one, Jay, but uh, baseball and softball is pretty close number two. Uh, is, is, it, is it true that, that, that come the season, um, when you have a legislative committee and you have umpire and Jake, that the umpire and Jake takes precedent? So yes, yeah, so I've, I've walked out of house sessions and I've walked out of committee meetings to, to get to a ball field in time. And I've had colleagues comment that, uh, you know, they don't know if they'd be able to get away with doing that, but their hometown people might crucify them if they were caught leaving a session to get to a ball game. And fortunately, I've been able to tell those colleagues that representing the west side of Columbus, which is a good old fashioned blue collar uh, sports loving area, that if, if my constituents knew I was leaving house session to get the ball game so I can umpire it, so the kids would have an umpire on time, I'd get a standing ovation. <laughs> So, uh, I don't worry about leaving house sessions to get out to a ball field. But, but one of the sort of anecdotal thing, um, before we get to politics, tell, tell them the uh, story that you told me about when you were, you know, so a cub reporter. I, I, I know you had some night, nighttime responsibility about, uh, about Jim Jordan and, and having blue and rights. <laughs> well, it's, uh, <laughs> If you ever saw some of those old movies about newspaper days, you know, back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, I mean, uh, it's a little stereotypical, but most of the types are, had a lot of truth in them. Um, there, was, uh, there was a strong correlation between old, hard bitten uh, news people and alcohol. Um, especially old, hard bitten uh, political reporters and sports reporters uh, tended to, uh, to like their drink. I mean, we have to plead guilty to that. And uh, there was a guy, uh, God rest his soul, who was the chief politics reporter, chief politics writer at the paper named Gene Jordan. And everybody feared Gene because he had a fierce temper. Um, he would bite your head off, and uh, when he had been drinking, he was three times as likely to do that. So uh, everybody tried to tiptoe around uh, Gene Jordan, and um, uh, he would uh, assign to himself the uh, top of the line chief political stories of the day, um, even when he was uh, so far into the sauce he wasn't capable of writing uh, coherently about those things. So I'm relatively new, um, a man in the night desk uh, of the paper back in the mid 70s, and Gene Jordan has assigned himself to go out and cover some political meeting. I'm sure it was an important political meeting in Columbus. Um, and he, uh, he went out to cover it, and uh, when he came back, I uh, had the elevator door open. I heard some serious shuffling coming down the hallway. It was Jim Jordan uh, shuffling back into the newsroom, trying to keep upright, and he shuffled over to his typewriter. This was long before computers. Uh, put his copy of paper in the typewriter, typed away a little bit, nodded off, typed away a little bit, nodded off, typed away a little more, nodded off. Finally, after typing away a little bit more, put his copy paper out of his uh, typewriter, shuffled past my desk where you dropped off your copy, where my job that evening was to give it a first edit, to review it, um, do a, a light edit, if you will, and then put it in, in another basket for the morning crew, because the dispatch was an evening newspaper at that time, and these stories would not be put to bed until the next morning. I was the acting night nice city editor at the time. I had to give it the first review, give it the first edit. So Gene put the copy paper in the basket, shuffled off to the elevator, left the building, and I picked up his copy paper, and it was hieroglyphics. It was impossible. It was complete gibberish. There was no way to tell if he had been to a meeting of a Democratic club, a Republican club, a Libertarian club, a Socialist club. I mean, you couldn't tell top and bottom of whatever it was, he was that far gone. Um, and so this is the first moral dilemma of my newspaper and career. I was on a paper by maybe two years at that time, and I wasn't going to take on the enjoy it. I, I could, the choice before me was to leave the copy as he submitted it for the morning crew to come in and discover um, just what it was, complete garbage. Uh, or to do some investigative work to figure out where he had been, what meeting he had gone to, who was there, and what the hell happened. <laughs> and, of course, that's the route I chose. I uh, started making phone calls to uh, political people around town, 
the county Democratic chairman, the county Republican chairman, are the uh, uh, important political people to find out what was going on that night that Gene Jordan would have felt was worthy of coverage. And once I found out where he had been and what went on, then I made a series of telephone calls to people who had been at that meeting so I could do a complete, from scratch, report of what he should have done. And uh, I wrote it up uh, based on my phone interviews with people who had been at that meeting, turned it in, left it at the uh, desk for the morning crew to see when they came in. The big thing I wondered, of course, was the next day or the day after, after Gene Jordan had read what I had written about what happened that night, uh, once he saw that published in the paper, that he recognized it as someone that's worth other than his own. And of course, uh, that conversation never occurred. Um, <laughs> so uh, I'm glad I chose that. I don't know what would have happened if I just turned him in, blew the whistle, said, you know, here's the here's what Gene turned in. But in all honesty, even though I don't want to make that out as commonplace, back in the day, uh, alcohol was common enough, a common enough affliction uh, in those rooms. But there, there was a lot of compensation like that. A lot of folks were covering for guys who were, were maybe very good in their day but had become uh, less incompetent based on the scourge of, uh, uh, of using the body too much um, uh, with uh, the bottle. Okay. So before I turn over to the class, um, why don't you talk a little bit about, about um, the Ohio Politics Almanac, uh, which is um, a publication that uh, Mike co-authors with the uh, a colleague at, um, at the uh, dispatch, Joe Howard. So, I want to tell you the, uh, the class what this is all about and why it becomes so popular you know, every four years, every two years, probably. Well, I, as I said, the dispatch, when I began covering politics, was an evening newspaper. Um, historically, even, even newspapers were the dominant papers in their markets, and the morning newspapers were normally the, the slimmer skinnier, uh, less vibrant newspaper, and that's a historical anomaly. Um, so when I started at the paper in 73 and started covering politics uh, shortly thereafter, um, when you have uh, a morning deadline for an afternoon press run, my morning deadline was 10 o'clock in the morning. If you're covering a politics beat like city hall or state government or county government, almost nothing happens before 10 o'clock in the morning. And so you're, you're constantly seeding to the other paper, your competition. You're seeding to the morning newspaper. Um, almost everything that happens that day, it's, 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 it was almost impossible in the 70s and 80s uh, to um, break news against the morning newspaper. And so I realized that if I was going to have a competitive edge uh, against the Columbus Citizen Girl, which was the morning paper I competed against, uh, I would need to develop um, something other than timeliness uh, because timeliness would always be on the side of the morning newspaper. So what I tried to develop in my uh, newspaper career was uh, depth uh, because we were the larger newspaper, we had a much larger, larger news hole, and I tried to take a current issue and put it in historical perspective. Um, a lot of my writing had to do with taking whatever the current issue of the day was that was salient that was um, newsworthy and putting it, uh, trying to explain how we got here, what events brought us to this day to make this such a burning issue today. And that's really what I did um, for, for many years at the dispatch. But if I developed a niche, that was it. So it, while I wrote those stories, I was compiling as I went a pretty rich uh, file, if you will, of uh, historical developments um, in Ohio's public policy, in Ohio's political evolution. And uh, I was frustrated a lot uh, that certain dates, certain events, certain things I was looking for uh, on deadline were not available. And so I decided in the uh, uh, late 80s, early 90s to try to take a lot of my files and convert them into a reference work. Uh, which grew into the Ohio Politics Almanac. I, I asked for permission at the dispatch to use my dispatch, some di dispatch time, dispatch equipment, uh, dispatch phone time, uh, dispatch computer time to uh, compile 
what became the Almanac because I thought it would be a benefit to the newspaper, it might be a benefit to other journalists, uh, academics, people who study uh, Ohio public policy, and fortunately it, it, it caught on, there was, there was a market for it. Um, so the first edition was published in 1996, but the second edition was published in 2006, and now the third edition um, just recently came out in the, in the fourth quarter of uh, 2015. And uh, it's, it's current up through um, uh, the last two-year cycle. Uh, so it's sort of set the stage for, for this year's presidential campaign. So thanks for mentioning Jay. Okay. Um, back then, when are we, when are we um, kind of send this over to the folks up in Akron? And uh, uh, as you can tell from um, my background, uh, that uh, he's an authority on, on Ohio elections. Um, and as we go into this 2016 cycle, uh, I'm sure he has a lot of opinions about um, what's going to happen, especially in Ohio, and as Ohio goes over as a country. So I'll turn over to you, Dr. Green, for questions from Akron. Uh, uh, thank you so much, Sherry. And uh, thank you, Representative Curtis, for being with us tonight. Um, just to get our question started, um, based on your experience, what do you make of the 2016 presidential campaign to date? Well, I'm, um, I'm, uh, what adjective am I searching for? I'm, uh, befuddled. I'm, uh, intrigued. I'm somewhat shocked. Um, I'm not seen. You know, in my uh, 40 plus years of uh, watching uh, presidential politics, we've not seen this before. We've not seen, in the, especially on the Republican side, the, the beginnings of the primary competition take place this far away from the 50 yard line. The, as we know, this is special in Ohio, but it's true for most of the country. The presidential elections, at least in a general election, are won or lost within the proverbial 40 yard lines. Uh, you know, the, the primaries may take place out here between the 30 and the 40 uh, because the Democratic Party is, you know, historically in the modern era been a center left party, and the, and the Republican Party has been a center right. A party, and you know my experience, and I think that that could be your experience, and Jerry's experience, in our adult lives has been to see, you know, an assemblage of candidates, be they Democrats or Republicans, uh, maybe. And I'm sorry for the sports analogy here, but you know, competing at least close to that 40 yard line. You know, uh, it, it, it would vary based on the decade, vary based on the domestic and foreign policy issues that were salient at the time. But at least, uh, and we have to know, you know, who's talking here. I'm a, uh, I consider myself a center left Democrat, uh, but not all that left, quite frankly. Fairly moderate, pragmatic, pretty much a centrist, which, you know, may be like, you know, somebody from the Galapagos Islands these days, a, a, a endangered species. Uh, to me, the fascinating thing is that if you can believe in the polls, and that's a whole other issue because I think they are less believable today than they've been in my adult experience uh, for reasons that, that you probably covered in the class and are fairly well known. Um, but it seems to me that uh, much of the Republican debate and argumentation has been taking place closer to the 2010 or even the blue line over here. On, on the right, um, and the Republican establishment, if you will, the, the money class, the Wall Street class, as well as the intellectual class, who are the heirs of William F. Buckley, the people who would care about what the National Review thinks, uh, the people who made up the, the gravitas, if you will, both the financial gravitas and the intellectual gravitas of the party, are as amazed as I am and as astonished as I am that here we are on the cusp of um, the Iowa caucuses and the New Hampshire primary seeing this uh, really outside the box. Uh, 
you know, uh, activity led by, by Trump and, uh, and Cruz. On the Democratic side, obviously, because of the relative paucity of candidates, it's been much more stable, if you will, uh, with, uh, you know, a, a traditional candidate, if you will, in, in Hillary Clinton, and a, a leftist candidate uh, in Sanders trying to drag her um, to the more, uh, you know, left populist um, area. Uh, so the Republicans that I know, your standard issue Ohio Republicans are definitely afraid that um, that this Trump-led, Cruz-led um, train could make their eventual nominee uh, unelectable, um, you know, come uh, come November. Now, I'm not that much of a uh, uh, pessimist or, or calamity um, uh, believer. I mean, I, I believe that neither Trump nor Cruz can win the nomination. I'm happy to go there if you want to go to that discussion. I, I believe that coming out of New Hampshire or perhaps coming out of South Carolina or certainly after Super Tuesday, that the money class and the intellectual class will emerge and they will pick one of the four that everybody's talking about in, in the more traditional mainstream vein, you know, from, from Rubio, Kasich, uh, Bush, and Christie, and one of those four will become the chosen one of the money Republicans and the intellectual Republicans, and I think whoever that person is will be the nominee, because I can't believe that um, that this country has changed that much to allow a Trump uh, or a Cruz to be the nominee. If that does happen, then all the, all the rules that we've sort of abided by in the last few decades are, are being rewritten. Before we go to the next uh, question, uh, Dr. Um, we cannot see a class in Akron. You can see us, but I understand that that's a function of whoever's doing the camera work in Akron. So it be nice for us to see who we're talking to. We'll get that taken care of. Thanks, Jerry. So who, who has a question for Representative Kirk? Sure, go ahead. Mike, can you hear me? I can. You can. Okay. So kind of following up on some of your thoughts, and earlier you mentioned the hyper-political environment even in the state legislature. What, what do you think are maybe, or what do you think is maybe one of the main causes of kind of the divide that we see now where there's no such thing as a win-win? You know, one party wins, one party loses particularly in the national legislature? Great question. I think there are many factors in that equation. Um, I think one of the largest factors in that multi-factor equation is that uh, for the average American, uh, average Democratic household, average Republican household, the pie has not been growing for over 20 years. If you look at the the economic statistics that we all pay attention to, uh, you know, median family income, median household income, uh, all those statistics that, that we churn out with great reliability in this country, uh, and you examine them closely, no matter what your ideological persuasion is, you come to the same conclusion, and that is that for most folks in this country, it's been harder and harder and harder to achieve the American dream uh, uh, because our economy has not been growing for the uh, great middle class, the middle class that began being assembled uh, after FDR uh, put in place the, the New Deal programs. And uh, as you know, I mean, not to get into a macroeconomic lecture that I'm incapable of giving because that's not my, my area, but it's it's, it's obvious and it's, it's, uh, it's undisputable that um, with, with technology, with uh, globalization, with so many uh, factors at play that, that the, the pie has not been growing for a great uh, slice of Americans. Um, and when, when you have that, and that's a relatively recent thing, Historically speaking, 
for the United States. It builds in all sorts of frustrations. It builds in all sorts of political scapegoating. Uh, it, 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 it builds a recipe for finger pointing uh, and for blaming the other guy, the other party. Um, that's one. Um, another factor uh, is, uh, I'm sure you've studied this, is hypergerrymandering. Uh, the party in power drawing districts that um, are complete Rorschach tests. They're completely illogical. Uh, uh, up in up in your area, you've got the uh, the snake on the lake. You know the ninth congressional district stretching from uh, Toledo to Cleveland. The, each of Ohio's 16 congressional districts is non-competitive. There's not one competitive district among the 16. That is new. That never happened before. Gerrymandering didn't happen before. I mean, gerrymandering is, is, is as old as a republic. And John Adams warned about, warned against it when he wrote the Constitution of Massachusetts. And we, we all know that gerrymandering has been a reality. But not this type of hyper gerrymandering where we're going to draw completely ridiculous districts that make no sense uh, at all. And what that has done is rewarded partisanship. It has made office holders fear only the primary and not the general. It's made sure that the game is played let's say earlier by the 20 yard line and not the 50 yard line. Uh, and when that's it certainly that's a reality in Ohio, it's a reality in North Carolina, it's a reality in Texas, it's a reality in so many of our key states, uh, our key big electoral states, that um, uh, we keep building and building and building. Um, uh, uh, incentives to move toward the edges, and not incentives to move toward the center. Um, certainly, the money game is another factor. I'll, I'll, I'll end with this one, but um, and, and the diminution of newspapers, and you know, the people who kind of you know, they strike shirts, um, referee, if you will. I mean, newspaper business used to be important. The the people who were sort of the guardians of the reasonable middle if you will, um, were much more important back in the day. And a guy like Trump would have been savaged uh, by all the newspapers that on everybody's doorstep every day. But those newspapers are, you know, shadows of their former selves. Nobody in your class reads a printed newspaper. If you do, you're a, you're a complete um, uh, rear duck. Uh, you know, and so the, the, the information splintering uh, where everybody's in an echo chamber and reading ideological blogs that they agree with as opposed to, you know, professionally vetted stuff, that it all rewards, um, you know, this type of partisan behavior as opposed to, can, you know, the rewards for compromise. Um, look at Mike DeWine. He's a friend of mine. I've known Mike a long time. I think he's a good and decent man. But he was pilloried by the right wing of his party for being part of the Gang of Four, uh, you know, for compromising with Ed uh, Kennedy, Edward Kennedy, and uh, on uh, judicial uh, confirmations. And it was a great service to this country to try to take some of the partisanship out of judicial Supreme Court um, uh, confirmations. And he believes that the, uh, a major reason that Sherrod Brown beat him uh, in, uh, what year was that, Jerry? Uh, 2000, and the show would be up in two more years, so. Uh, 1806. Yeah, I mean, Mike Dwyer to this day believes that uh, because the, the right wing sat on their hands when he was up for re election against Sheriff Brown, he, he lost. And so he's been doing everything he can as Attorney General you know, to, to throw red meat to the beast, you know, to the right wing. And, um, you do what you're rewarded for. And I think, not to pick on Mike, you know, but, but I think that's uh, an obvious example. Um, I see it all the time in the State House where, where folks are worried about their right or their left and not worried about, you know, what they can achieve through compromise. And so it's, it's a problem that we have to solve because it leads to no real good. Let me, let me do a follow up on that. You, you talked about being involved with, you know, with, with the legislative redistricting, which was on the ballot and, and was approved. A lot of people uh, around the country thought that Ohio was doing something about 
congressional redistricting, which of course we weren't, and, and then you said that you didn't, you're now involved with trying to do something about that. What does that entail? Do we have to go back and change the Constitution, or how does that work? Well, in order to get, uh, in order to get reapportionment reform for 132 legislative districts, our 99 House districts, and 33 Senate districts, we had to change the Constitution because the apportionment process uh, is a state constitutional process. Uh, we've got that done. Um, congressional redistricting has never been a constitutional process. Congressional redistricting has been done through legislation, a bill passed by the House and signed by the governor. That doesn't mean that Ohioans cannot choose to make it a constitutional process. We could adopt a proposed amendment to the state constitution to uh, reform congressional redistricting like we just did with uh, state reapportionment. But when the Democrats and Republicans were coming together to pass the joint resolution that became State Issue 1 that asked Ohioans to reform the apportionment reform and give us a logical process for drawing state legislative districts, the powers to be on the Republican side uh, want to know part of it. John Boehner, as House Speaker, sent the message to uh, the Ohio Senate President, the Ohio House uh, Speaker, that we want our districts left alone. And why wouldn't you? You know, in a state with 16 congressional districts, Republicans controlling 12 of those 16, um, uh, Boehner sent the message that uh, he did not want uh, the districts tampered with. In fact, uh, before September of 2011, when he ordered the districts to be drawn as they are, he wanted them drawn in such a manner that the 12 safe Republican districts would be drawn and four safe, I'm sorry, 12 safe Republican districts would be drawn and four safe Democratic districts. So um, we could choose as Ohioans, you know, through the initiative process to either come with a proposed uh, amended statute to change the Ohio Revised Code or proposed constitutional amendment to change the Constitution. Um, it can happen either way, but right now there doesn't appear to be any uh, appetite among House and Senate leaders on the Republican side to change uh, redistricting. We have, however, in the last few weeks, and I'm sure you recognize this with your, your news reports, some Republican voices have started coming forward, so we need to do it. To, to solve this hyperpartisanship problem. Governor Kasich in New Hampshire uh, two weeks ago was asked by some reporters about it and he said we need to do it. Uh, that was followed by former Governor Bonovich coming out, issuing a statement saying it's time to do it. And then Governor Taft came out and said it's time to do it. So if enough credible, authoritative uh, Republican voices keep adding their, their voices to the chorus, just maybe, you know, just maybe, uh, the pressure system can be built for congressional redistricting reform to happen uh, at the state house. Absent Republican leadership deciding to do it uh, because they're ashamed into doing it, um, it will only happen through the initiative process if there's enough money to be found to finance what is a multi-million dollar effort to qualify an issue for the ballot and then to pass it. So I'm not optimistic. I'm not holding my breath. It doesn't look to me like it's going to happen, but. At least in recent weeks, there have been some very influential Republican voices saying we need to do it. Sorry, can you all see us now? Yes, thank you. Okay, good. Um, other question for up to the curtain? Yes, sir. I have a question just going back to the presidential election. Um, we've seen in the past kind of this phenomenon where, um, especially if there's a really polarizing president in office, the uh, following election, you know, people kind of seem to run to the opposite of that person. We saw it in like 2008 where the upbringing and demeanor and just overall um, politics of Barack Obama was really polar opposite of Bush. Do you think that's happening again in this Republican primary or are we seeing something different? I think this Republican primary is, is much different. Uh, I think the, the level of um, outside-the-box commentary, if you will, the level of um, um, the level of ad hominem attacks, the level of uh, assertions that there are no reality to any fact-checking, um, 
you know, are astonishing. Uh, I'm not painting all of them with the same brush, um, but um, if, if you read, I'm sure many of the uh, people in the class do, the, the, the basic fact checking that goes on by your normal, you know, mainstream news sources on after the debates and after campaign appearances, you know, checking assertions made by candidates with you know, what the what the facts are. Um, never have I seen such a golf between the rhetoric and, and the reality. Um, it, it's more true on the Republican side. And that's not a I don't think a biased political statement. It's just the nature of having um, you know so many candidates in the field and uh, trying to uh, pick up. Uh, as much of a base, if you will, as as possible, and, and I'd be interested in, in Jerry's view and Dr. Green's view, but you know, my sense is that with the parties moving further and further apart, and the Republican Party moving further and further to the right in, in recent years, that base, you know, that Tea Party base, if you will, that hard right base of the Republican Party, is at least 30 or 35 percent of the party. <laughs> Uh, at least of the primary vote. Um, and so that drives that type of commentary. It's the red meat, you know, who could throw the, the rawest, reddest red meat to the base? Um, but I think, but I'm a traditionalist, I think that can't prevail uh, over a long marathon of, uh, of primaries once you get into the their stable states, if you will. In the Super Tuesday states and then the rest of the states. I, I don't think that can hold, but we're going to see. Another question? Yes, sir. I'd like to come back to Ohio and the race between, um, well, the race for the Senate. We have uh, Ted Strickland and the sit and build situation. Would you comment on that? But at first, I want to say some of us old people. Still read the newspaper. <laughs> well, then, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, I think the Strickland Sittenfeld race is a classic. Uh, it's a very interesting uh, race to watch. I mean, Sittenfeld has already outperformed expectations. Uh, there's no question that those of us who met him in along, and I, I met him months ago at a, at a breakfast at a Bob Evans. I was impressed with him, and I met him. He's clearly a, a major league intellect. Uh, he's clearly somebody with great potential. But, you know, I, I chalk it up to uh, your, your traditional guy who's got very little chance of knocking off uh, a household name, you know, like Ted Strickland. He's exceeded expectations. He is putting the pressure on uh, Ted Strickland. In my view, Ted is still uh, certainly the, the favorite. He's adopted the classic Rose Garden strategy. Uh, ignore your opponent unless you absolutely cannot. If you are a household name and the other guy, um, you know, is uh, coming out of Cincinnati or is known only to a slice of the Cincinnati or Southwestern Ohio electorate, I mean, it's the standard approach to ignore him and talk about your real opponent being uh, Portland and not Sittenfeld, but, and, and not the feather of Jerry's nest, because uh, I know he's been in the Sittenfeld campaign, but I know a number of people who are part of the Sittenfeld campaign, and his ability to uh, go after Strickland, but not in a mean way. You know, not in a way that uh, will truly cost Strickland that much in a general election campaign, in my view. Not in a uh, harsh, ad hominem way. He's, he's walked that tightrope. I mean, when I sat down with, uh, when I sat down with Sittenfeld at that breakfast at Bob Evans, and he was asking me about the race, you know, I said, there's nothing for you to lose in this race. I don't see a downside if you stay in it and, and give it your all, as long as if you're not the nominee, if you don't pull this thing off, you're not seen as having um, dented Ted Strickland in a major way, in a major, you know, uh, character way that's going to damage him. Uh, and, 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 and if he comes close but doesn't knock off Portland, be seen as the reason, you know, that he didn't. And I think. You know, I think the campaign is 
not strictly hard, but not unfairly hard. You know, it's brought up records like, you know, the, the gun stuff, the AI rating stuff, all legitimate debating point stuff. So he's, he's impressed me greatly, and this, this race may be a lot closer than I thought it was going to be. My money is still on Strickland, um, but then I'm a, I'm a traditionalist, and, and uh, you know, I think having the, um, uh, the type of endorsements that he has, having the traditional support that he has will, will rule the day, but I would not be shocked if this thing doesn't turn out to be a whole lot closer than I thought it would be a few months ago. And if uh, a certain film would happen to pull it off, I'd be mildly shocked, but not nearly as shocked as I would have been several months ago because he has uh, managed in a very impressive way to really put the pressure on um, uh, with, with issues that, uh, that, that are important in a Democratic primary. Um, I do think Rob Portman is um, vulnerable, especially if at the top of the ticket we have uh, the Democrats have a Hillary Clinton and the Republicans have a nut job. Then I think Tom Suttles is right in the column he wrote for the uh, plane dealer in the dispatch uh, last weekend. You know, I think that the coattail effect has always been strong in presidential election years between the president and Senate. And um, uh, I think problems change the uh, if uh, under that scenario. Patty, did you have another question? I was just going to ask him what he thought about Portman, and he answered it before I asked. Okay. Well, just, just a couple words about Portman. Um, you know, 20 years ago, um, I think Portman would have been the strongest Republican uh, presidential nominee that that party could put up. Here's a guy whose who's, you know, intellect is on par with anyone's who had been a uh, budget director, uh, had been a, a U.S. trade representative, who understands domestic and foreign politics as well as anybody I know, who comes from the state of Ohio. Um, you know, in my book, and this is no slam on, on John Kasich, Rob Porter has few peers, certainly few peers in, in Ohio Republican politics. In, in my book, and they are, maybe I'm too Ohio-centric here, but few peers in national Republican politics. Now he's as bland as they get. Um, there's no question about that. He's, he's, he's lacking in charisma. But if, if you think substance trumps, you know, flash, then, I mean, I think Rob Portman is a uh, tremendous uh, commodity but maybe in this celebrity age that we're working, that we're now living in, a celebrity age that seems to reward the the, uh, the Trumps of the world, uh, you know, boring substance doesn't seem to have the cachet that it had when I was uh, in my prime. Uh, previously, when we were talking about the um, presidential election and uh, politics in general, we talked about uh, uh, hyper uh, partisanship, hyper partisanship, and you mentioned how you were uh, doing things like uh, redrawing districts to hopefully make things uh, tending less towards that. But you also talked about how there are there's a technological issue there, and also how. Uh, Places like uh, newspapers are now going out of business, which used to moderate things and allow for more, uh, perhaps, neutral criticism of that. But that doesn't seem like it's necessarily going to have an easy solution. So do you think that hyper-partisanship is going to be perhaps a more permanent feature of American politics from now on? Great question. Um, I would hope not. Uh, I think... I, I think uh, our country will be roiled, um, R-O-I-L-E-D, not roiled as in kings and queens. Um, I, I think our country will have profoundly more difficult problems uh, governing itself and exercising its influence in the world if we see a never-ending um, Increase in the type of hyperpartisanship we've been witnessing over the last several years. This leads to nowhere good. Um, I'm not a believer in the permanency, though, of anything in, in American politics. I'm a disciple of 
the Schlesingers. I mean, uh, old Arthur Schlesinger and his son, um, Professor Green, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was an uh, uh, old man Schlesinger that wrote The Cycle of Politics. Um, uh, the old pendulum theory, if you will. Uh, and then his son wrote a companion going to that later on. I mean, basic premise being that in a country as diverse and as pluralistic and as complex um, and as stable historically as the United States, that swings to the far left or swings to the far right cannot prevail for long, that the center will hold, that the gravitational pull of the great center will punish extremism and will reward moderation. I still believe that, and I still think that the election of 2016 will show that the center holds. Uh, it'll take longer for the center to exert itself, perhaps, but I'm here to say that the Republican nominee will be one of the four previously mentioned, Rubio, Christie, Bush, or Kasich, because they are closer to the middle. They're closer to that moderate um, uh, gravitational pull, and that Hillary will be the Democratic nominee because they play and, and have the capacity of playing within those 40 yard lines that I previously mentioned. So we're experiencing this hyperpartisanship, but I'm not a pessimist about it being uh, on a never ending path. Uh, I tend to be an optimist that we're going to cure it. But uh, it's going to take a little longer to cure it than a lot of us would have hoped. Uh, another question for Representative? Uh, yeah, Jeff. I'm not exactly sure of the uh, acronym. Is it APAC that writes uh, legislation, conservative legislation for uh, SPAC? The AOC, the American Legislative Exchange Council? Maybe that's it, yeah. Do they have any influence in Ohio? Influence nationally. Uh, if we're talking about the same organization, uh, the American Legislative Exchange Council, uh, it's a right wing think tank that writes proposed modern legislation for both Washington and for state houses around the country. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they, they ship out this model legislation uh, to um, conservative and Republican leaders. Um, and hope that they will emulate it. Now, there are also leftist think tanks you know, in Ohio and nationally who do the same thing on the Democratic side and on the liberal side, um, but they've not been as effective uh, as of late uh, simply because of the dominance of Republicans in their state houses. Um, and I don't have the statistics on the top of my mind, but uh, there are only uh, eight or ten for state houses in the country where you have both a Democratic governor and a Democratic control of the legislature, and you have 30 some uh, Republican state houses where that exists. Uh, and so we're in a moment of time here, partly because of Jerry Andrew, uh, partly because of just the way um, demographics have worked. Uh, liberals and Democrats have tended to flock to the metropolitan centers, um, uh, living in the, in the big urban areas. And uh, Republicans and conservatives tend to be more scattered across the broad swath of America. And when you have that, people grouping themselves that way, it makes gerrymandering a lot easier. It makes gerrymandering a whole lot uh, easier. And, and that, that's what has happened in, in the last couple of election cycles. But um, I tend not to be a pessimist about uh, America reinventing itself. It's been our history. And I think that extremism over the long haul will be punished and moderation will be rewarded, but um, this election cycle is testing that old-fashioned notion. Uh, Alex, you had a question. So uh, a, lo a lot of our guests um, that have uh, spent some time in the State House or in um, covering state politics have uh, wonderful and, and fascinating stories about former Speaker Vern Reif. Um, so I'm wondering if you have a favorite Vern Rife story and if you would share it with us. But you can tell. <laughs> but I can tell. Um, Vern Rife was a dictator. Uh, you know, Vern Rife ruled with an iron 
fist. Uh, he believed in rewards and punishments, so he was old school in that way. Uh, he let his committee chairs know what legislation he wanted bottled up and what legislation he wanted to come out of committee, and he wanted to know where every vote was, and he wanted the votes in committee and the votes in the House to be what he wanted. And if he wasn't getting what he wanted, then he would strip a committee, a committee chair of that committee, put him in the doghouse for a couple months or six months or eight months. And so uh, the, 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 the upside of him was he was a strong uh, leader who was willing to work with the other party. He was always willing to cut a deal with Paul Gilmore when Gilmore was Senate president or with Stanley Aronoff when Aronoff was Senate president, both of those women being Republicans. Um, he, he, uh, he was a dictator, um, but he was um, a somewhat benevolent you know, dictator, if you will. Um, he wanted to work with the other party. He believed in a moderate uh, Ohio. And um, he recruited, he knew that he knew that the Democratic Party in Ohio cannot be successful if it's just liberal. The very nature of Ohio, its entire history, its demographics, its political makeup, the Democratic Party in the long haul in Ohio can only be successful if it's a center left party with the C and center capitalized. And you can only control the Ohio House, like he did, if you recruit from the soil. You recruit the Harry Malotts, you know, the Fred Dillings, the Jim Bramstons, the Bill Heinegs. I mentioned names that mean nothing to anybody who's under 60 uh, in that class. But these were conservative Democrats from conservative areas. If they weren't conservative, they'd never been elected in the first place. And the mistake we make as Democrats in Ohio is when we insist on too much purity, too much ideological purity, if we do, we'll never control the state house, uh, at least the legislative branch of, of the state house, because 68 out of our 88 counties are always red. You know, uh, uh, only a maximum of 20 counties in Ohio are either blue or purple. And when that's your demographic reality, you cannot be a liberal party. And Jim certainly wasn't liberal. Um, he was a speaker for 20 years because he understood Ohio. Uh, he was a student of Ohio, and he, he was going to recruit those county commissioners and those county auditors and those county engineers and those um, township officials who were known in their communities, who reflected their communities, who were moderate to conservative in their nature because of what they lived in those areas. And if we're going to be successful in recapturing the legislative branch, uh, for Democrats in Ohio, we need two things. We need to fix gerrymandering, uh, which state issue one hopefully did, even though it doesn't take effect until 2022. I think it, that would fix gerrymandering and give us fair districts. And then we need to recruit out in the exurbs and out in the rural areas people who reflect the, uh, the values and reflect the realities of those. Uh, of those territories. Uh, so I'm not a pessimist, I think I'm a, I'm a realist. Um, uh, Ohio has never been a 50-50 state. I mean, a lot of people make the mistake of saying we're 50-50. We've never been 50-50. We're pretty much, in the modern era, a 53 to 54 percent Republican state, a 36 to 47 percent Democratic state. The odds are always against Democrats in Ohio by the very nature of those 68 red counties. Um, that's what Democrats have to always keep in mind. Don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. The good is to, you know, have power to control. Uh, and uh, that's, that, that's, that's what goes on in primaries. You've got a war right now for the soul of the Republican Party, and you've got a, a, a lesser war, but still a war, for the soul of the Democratic Party. You know, Bernie trying to pull up every left wing. Um, and uh, and Cruz and uh, uh, Cruz and, and well, God knows what Trump really is, but you know Cruz and and, and Santorum and uh, Carson and uh, uh, you know others, you know, trying to pull the, the Republican Party ever further rightward. In the long term, neither of those directions work. 
to hold power for law in America, or certainly in Ohio. Another question for Representative Kern? Yeah, go ahead, Eric. Uh, Mr. Curtin, I don't have a question. I just wanted to thank you for your hard work in defeating Issue 3. Thank you. Thank you. I was, uh, I was, uh, I was greatly influenced by a David Broder book uh, published in 2000 um, called Democracy Derailed. If you want to look on uh, uh, Amazon.com, you can read about a third and a half of this book without even paying for it. It's a heavily excerpt, excerpted, but Democracy Derailed by David Broder, uh, the subtitle of that book was uh, something to the effect of um, initiative campaigns and the power of money. In fact, I think that's exactly what it was. Democracy Derailed, initiative campaigns and the power of money. And what Broder chronicled in that book was in the 18 states that allow the constitutional initiative, Ohio is one of those 18 states. Um, there has been a recent upsurge, a recent phenomenon of moneyed interests figuring out how to partner with sharp political entrepreneurs to shape a proposed policy to do something that looks like reform, whether it be education reform, whether it be drug reform, whether it be transportation reform, to do it in such a way to enrich the investors in that campaign. Um, and I saw this coming, this mother folks saw this coming, where uh, Ian James, a political entrepreneur in Columbus, saw the polls. If you, if you, if you follow the polls on marijuana, you, you know what they say. Uh, there's an ever-increasing majority of uh, Americans more and more comfortable with legalizing marijuana, certainly for medical purposes, but increasingly for recreational purposes. Um, seeing these poll results, Ian James got there first to qualify initiative with some deep pocketed money behind him to reform Ohio's drug laws. And for me, the issue wasn't marijuana. It was what David Brewer wrote about back in 2000. So watch out for this trend because this has taken the initiative, which was a, a Teddy Roosevelt reform, you know, to, to check big money, to check big power, to check tyrants, to make sure that people had an avenue to qualify something for the ballot to control those in power. And this is taking initiative, turning it on its head to reward the money of interests, the people who actually are the shrewd rich operators. And it just happened to be about marijuana in Ohio. Uh, there's no one coming at us on green energy. I'm all for green energy, but not for a proposal. And you may see it qualified for the ballot here later this year. There are a group of folks out of Delaware, the state of Delaware, uh, have formed an LLC, a little library company, to ask Ohio to approve a multi-billion dollar bond issue. Your money and my money, state money, uh, general obligation bonds to invest in green energy projects. And oh, by the way, the allocation of those resources would be controlled by this dollar-based LLC. Put their hands on our billions. It's, it's, it's breathtaking in its audacity. And so I saw this on the marijuana front and wanted to get out in front of it to, to pass issue two and defeat issue three to put something in place in our constitution to make this harder to do. Um, this is a bigger issue that you're going to see more of, but I recommend at least a perusal of that brilliant book, Democracy to Rail, for a nice tutorial on the initiative process and how it can be subverted, and in my view, this is a strong word, but prostituted for things it was never intended to do. Your, your commitment of leadership on issue two, the past election, how much of that was predicated about what was not done when the, when the, the casino issue was on the ballot that was basically analogous? It, it was. A casino uh, passage uh, in 19... Two thousand nine. Two thousand nine, right? Two thousand nine. Uh, well, the big difference there is the only way to bring casino gambling to Ohio is through a constitutional amendment, um, and that's because of the eighteen fifty one bar on gambling schemes in our state constitution. That, that eighteen fifty one bar was put in place because of all the get rich quick operators that were fleecing pioneer Ohioans. Um, and so when we wanted to have the Ohio lottery. 
You can only bring it through a constitutional amendment. So in 1973, Ohio has approved a constitutional amendment to legalize Ohio lottery. And then two years later, in 1975, Ohioans decided to amend the Constitution again to legitimize charitable bingo. That charitable bingo had been going on for decades, of course, in, in Catholic church halls and Elks clubs and, and, and Masonic lodges and, and so forth, but it was illegal. And we were legalizing, we had to amend the state constitution because of our 1851 bar. So for, for entrepreneurs who wanted to bring casino gambling to Ohio, the only way to do it was through a constitutional amendment. So that was the big difference there. But these guys were shoot operators in terms of putting their own parcel numbers in their amendments so that casinos could only be built on land they owned. Um, so that that's the difference. But the casino amendment in 09 uh, was a precursor. It was a, a warning of what big money can do. That was a $50 million campaign uh, to amend the Constitution to, to essentially grant someone a monopoly. Uh, people took note of that. And the people who bankrolled the marijuana campaign last year used the casino uh, campaign as a model to emulate and try to emulate it in many regards. Fortunately, issue two passed, which now will make it very difficult for these types of guys in the future to do that. Not impossible, but more difficult. Um, so um, I thought last November's election was a big win for the Ohio Constitution. Other questions for Senator Curtin? Well, I have one. Uh, Representative Curtin, how do you see the case of Campbell as we go forward through Iowa and New Hampshire? And do you really think he could win the nomination? I think Governor Casey could win the nomination. About three or four weeks ago, on a uh, Sunday morning public affairs show on Channel 4, the NBC affiliate here in Columbus, I put it at 50 to 1. You know, I now put it more at 20 to 1. Um, he's made great progress. Um, it's been a shrewd campaign. Uh, it's been built on, as you know, putting all these chips on New Hampshire um, and competing for that so-called establishment lane. Um, he has reinvented himself a couple times already in the campaign. He's pivoted a couple times to show a whole different side of himself. You know, uh, a lot of us who have followed John Kasich since 1978, when he was first elected in the state senate, had to chuckle at seeing him portray himself as a candidate of sweetness and light. Uh, <laughs> you know, but the things he got to do in campaigns, and uh, he came off as a candidate of sweetness and light. He just picked up. As I'm sure you saw, the Boston Globe endorsement, um, which normally in many states, um, you know, outside of the home state of Massachusetts, might not be that influential, but in a, in a state that allows uh, cross-over voting, essentially, um, like New Hampshire does, uh, I thought the Boston Globe endorsement, and he's got a number of others. I mean, he, I think he's leading the pack right now in newspaper endorsements. Uh, I think the New Haven paper. Endorsed him, uh, the Nashville paper, I believe, endorsed him. You folks probably know better than I, so I've not been keeping a list. But um, in his ground game, uh, the people who have been who have been running his campaign figured early on not only do we have to put almost all of our chips in New Hampshire, but they say we have to have a ground game. And Doug Price, who Jerry knows and, and I know, uh, known for a long time is a very, very experienced and shrewd uh, political operator who understands the day in, day out, laborious method of putting together a ground game. Um, John Kasich would be, have uh, delegates in every uh, district, every congressional district in every state that is hosting their primary air caucus. Donald Trump can't say that. Very few of the Republican candidates can say that. He's got a ground game everywhere, and his ground game in New Hampshire, I think, rivals anybody's ground game. Um, uh, so let's, you know, what 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 Trump's, uh, what else in, in presidential politics? Is it more the substance or more the flash? Donald, Donald Trump is the king of the flash, uh, while Kasich's uh, team, have been working and working and working and working 
to put in place a, a, a grassroots operation that will actually turn people out on election day. So I, uh, I've been very impressed uh, with what they've been able to do. I still don't give it better than 20 to 1 uh, right now because I think Rubio, if I had to pick one of those four, I'd pick Rubio first, by Bush second, Kasich third, and Christie fourth, but who the hell knows. Um, I just think Rubio has the, the characteristics that uh, kind of cover the waterfront, um, uh, whereas Kasich is, uh, uh, his prickly personality, you know, it, it is, I think, a big detriment to him. He's been trying to work on it, but uh, Rubio is the, the uh, slickest, uh, most eloquent uh, performer with a pretty good mind and a pretty facile manner um, and enough conservative credentials to not be totally distrusted by the, the red meat people. Um, I mean, he, he could put it together, I think, but I, he's just been coming on. Uh, I, I have a 50 to 1 and I'm a 20 to 1. That's for next week, I'm, you know. Or two weeks, maybe I've got him at five to one or ten to one. He's he's exceeded expectations, no doubt about that. Another question? Yeah. Speaking of Kasich, and then before the money and, and the legislature behind certain uh, amendments, how do you think the Citizens United, or how seriously do you think the Citizens United decision in 2010 is affecting both national and state? elections where a group like the Koch brothers can come in and pour $10 million into a, a uh, race and almost decide the outcome in whichever way they want. Well, the Citizens United decision has changed everything at the national level. Uh, it has made dark money the king. Um, you still have ways of, of, of tracking how dark money is being uh, allocated because expenditures are expenditures and and, and they show up in, in TV time and they show up in uh, literature and they show up in so many ways that you can still sort of piece together how much dark money is being spent but uh, there are ways to hide where it's actually coming from, you know, who the donors are uh, putting all this money in. So the, the, the expenditures are a lot easier to track than the contributions but it's changing everything because it, it, it is dwarfed the, the regular money, um, and the you know the so-called uh, prohibition against um, cooperation. You know the campaigns aren't supposed to cooperate with these so-called independent entities. Well, it's pretty much a facade now. I mean, it's a wink and a nod. And what is your police unit trying to draw where that line uh, is? So it, it, it's changed the game. Um, in, uh, in manifest ways, um, I would like to think that at some point enough Americans will um, insist upon, you know, dragging campaign finance back into the light of day. But um, right now, it's a, it's a humongous beast that is, that is changing everything. Not, not so much at the statewide level, um, um, at the, as at the national level, at least in Ohio, I've not seen, you know, uh, you know, big, big dark money influences. I've seen it small ways, but not big major ways yet uh, in Ohio. Uh, I don't know if you know, you've heard of the uh, Wolf Pack, but they're basically supporting a constitutional amendment that would eliminate uh, private funding to campaigns and just go with strictly public funding towards campaigns. Would that be something like that you and your colleagues would be interested in or think would be a decent idea? Well, I think the, uh, the age-old debate about you know, public funding of campaigns is a really debate, but today there's no traction behind it. Um, there's very little traction behind it. Uh, it's very difficult to sell Americans on uh, their tax dollars, um, you know, funding campaigns. Uh, very difficult exercise. It's, it's more of an intellectual exercise than a real world exercise right now. Now I know there's a lot of grassroots organizing activity out there. There's, there's one, a group in Central Ohio, you know, it's dedicated to overturning uh, Citizens United. I don't discount those efforts. I don't discount the uh, intellectual honesty of, of people who are trying to organize to overturn Citizens United. But um, 
that's a tall hill to climb. I mean, that uh, I fear that that beast is out of the cage, and um, at least for the foreseeable future, is not going to be recaged. Um, it would take a, a, a whole different U.S. Supreme Court, you know, down the road to overturn that. And, and I don't see the organizing ability for all these well-intentioned people to put together uh, an effort that would mobilize enough Americans to, um, you know, to do it through um, uh, a citizen-initiated amendment process. That is such a tall mountain to climb that uh, I just don't see it in my lifetime. Well, we have, I have one more question for you, Representative Curtin, and that is we heard over the weekend that uh, Mayor Bloomberg, former mayor of New York, is contemplating an independent run for the presidency. And as you no doubt read, the timing of his decision-making is you know, to be later in the primaries to see if, um, if more establishment candidates run or less establishment candidates run. What do you think about the prospects of, of an independent candidacy by someone not only as wealthy as Mayor Bloomberg, but former Mayor Bloomberg, but also somebody who's had a lot of success as a mayor and as a public? Well, it's fascinating. Uh, you know, I certainly followed Mayor Bloomberg. Uh, um, what he well, I was familiar with his business career before he became mayor of New York. So we followed his. Uh, their oral career uh, in New York, and been watching him since. I mean, he he certainly has the capacity to um, change the dynamic of the presidential race. Um, as you know, uh, American history has um, been very tough on um, independent candidacies for president. Um, you can't point to a successful one, uh, but you can point to a lot that um, took enough votes away from one person to give um, the election to another person. Um, so he could be an enormous factor in the race, but, the, but running the presidency as an independent would be unprecedented. Uh, not impossible, but a real, real long shot. You know, it, 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 one comment that I think it would be important for Mayor Bloomberg to read the U.S. Constitution in terms of what are the requirements um, for requisites of someone to run for president, even as an independent, but not just that you have to be born uh, in the United States, you have to be at least five foot eight. <laughs> so I think he's going to have a problem there. I mean, you know, it's a state by state, you know, the laws are different in every state. And so to get started, as late as he'd be getting started and organize and to qualify for the ballots in all these states as an independent, uh, it is an enormous, enormous logistical exercise. Now, if you have unlimited resources, and those are nearly unlimited, uh, it's not impossible, but it would be a humongous effort. Uh, I think the only way that he does that is if it's Sanders against Cruz and Trump. Yeah. Representative Curtin, thank you so much for being with us. Ladies and gentlemen, let's thank our guests. Thank you. Thank you very much.